Good evening, and welcome to our online book launch event for Paul Mariani's ninth poetry collection, All That Will Be New, recently published by Slant Books. My name is Gregory Wolf, and I am Slant's publisher and editor. Slant is an independent, not-for-profit literary press specializing in fiction, poetry, creative nonfiction, philosophy, and belles lettres. Slant titles are marked by the kind of meticulous craft and passion for language that are harder and harder to come by in our age of instant publishing and literary gimmickry. In an age of polarization, tribalism, and ideology, Slant upholds the humanist tradition, which reminds us that art's first duty is an open-eyed exploration of both the glories and the ambiguities of the human condition. As Emily Dickinson put it, tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Tonight, we're thrilled to celebrate the poetry of Paul Mariani, one of our most distinguished literary figures, a poet and a biographer of poets. To do that, we're honored to have with us two nationally recognized writers who I will soon introduce. Each of our guests will share a favorite poem or two from All That Will Be New, and then Martine will introduce Paul, who will read selected poems from his book. Over the course of the presentation this evening, if you have questions for Paul, feel free to type them in the chat. And assuming we have a little time at the end, we will pass those along to him. Oh, don't plan to keep you much more than an hour or so. So thank you for joining us this evening. And now I'd like to introduce and to welcome Angela O'Donnell. Angela is a writer, poet, and professor at Fordham University in New York City, where she teaches English, creative writing, and American Catholic studies. She also serves as associate director of the Curran Center for American Catholic Studies. O'Donnell is a graduate of Penn State University and holds a master's and PhD in English language and literature from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Angela, welcome to you today. Thanks so much, Greg. Um, and thank you so much, Paul, uh, for your beautiful new book that we have a chance to celebrate tonight. I'm delighted to be part of the program. Um, and for those of you who I'm sure you all know about this wonderful new book, All That Will Be New, we will be putting the, um, uh, the link to purchase the book in the chat. So please avail yourself of that at any point this evening while we're talking about the book and while we're listening to Paul read. Uh, so I'd like to say a few words about Paul and, and then read a poem. I first heard the name Paul Mariani when I was a 22 year old graduate student in a contemporary American poetry class. My professor praised and recommended his biography of William Carlos Williams that had been published recently. I dutifully took note not only of the title, but of the author's name, Mariani. I was a working class grandchild of Italian immigrants, first generation college student, and a room full of people with non-ethnic names for the most part. By the way, my name is Alimo. Uh, I, the Irish O'Donnell is gifted to me by my Irish husband. I really have the blood of Sicilian immigrants rather than Irish kings in my veins. Paul's name was familiar to me. I went to school with Mariani's in Northeastern Pennsylvania. In fact, my first boyfriend was named Mariani. And the fact that an Italian American with origins and background similar to my own wrote books that were highly prized by the academic community made me think I can do this too. It made me think that I could find a place among the decidedly non-ethnic scholars and poets of English and American literature. Fast forward 20 years. I'm a professor and a poet in the English department at a Jesuit college in Baltimore. And I decide to invite the great Paul Mariani to our campus. By that time, Paul's reputation as a biographer was practically unparalleled among American literature scholars, having written and published his biographies of Lowell, Berryman, and Crane. In addition, Paul had written a memoir about his development and his identity as a Catholic poet, 30 days on retreat with the exercises of St. Ignatius. And he also published five collections of poems, most recently his beautiful book, The Great Wheel. This was not a popular admission to make, that one's religious upbringing shapes one's art. 
In fact, in most academic and poetry circles, admitting to religious belief typically resulted in one losing IQ points in the estimation of one's colleagues. This is still unfortunately the case in many places 20 years later. I too considered myself a Catholic poet, a writer who had inevitably been, been shaped by my formation as an Italian Catholic working class kid. Though Paul was much more accomplished than I, I knew we had more in common than just our working class Italian American heritage. I admired Paul's courage in coming out as a Catholic as it gave other writers of our stamp the courage to do so as well. I wanted my students to read Paul's work and to meet him, and I wanted to meet him too. Paul, I don't know if you will remember much of that visit. I doubt it. You have made thousands of such visits, but I think you might remember something of our hair raising ride from the airport into Baltimore. I picked Paul up in my beat up soccer mom, soccer mom green Chrysler minivan, and we were tooling along the Baltimore Washington Parkway chatting easily about literature, his new books, our favorite writers, when suddenly we blew a tire. I pulled over to the very narrow shoulder of the road and we sat there while the rush hour traffic whizzed by us at 70 miles an hour. This was early days for cell phones and neither of us had a working cell phone. So there was no calling AAA or the police or a family or a friend for help. Paul's reading was to take place in an hour we were halfway between Baltimore and DC and we didn't have a prayer of getting there in time. This could have been a horrific experience, but it wasn't. It's remarkable the fascinating conversations you can have with a person you barely know when you find yourself in a helpless, semi-dangerous, verging on desperate situation. Among those conversations, I recall three, the challenges of raising sons. We are both the parents of three boys, the usefulness of cell phones, and our fondness for the stories of Catholic writer Andre Debuse. It's no accident, of course, that we were thinking of Debuse. As most of our listeners will likely recall, Debuse was horribly injured one night when he stopped to help a motorist on the side of the road. He was hit by a passing car and as a result was wheelchair bound for the rest of his life. Though he, Paul and I never mentioned this dreadful incident, it was very much on our minds. Neither of us was getting out of that car, and we had little hope that anyone else would be foolhardy enough to stop to help us. And that's when a truck pulled up behind us. A strange man got out, came to my window, and told me he was going to change our tire. And so he did, while Paul and I sat in the front seat of the van and watched him risk his life for our sake. We were amazed at his generosity and kindness. I'm sure we used the word grace, helpless Catholics that we are, for this was a gift we didn't do anything to deserve. After he finished, we offered him a $20 bill, a small token of our appreciation. He refused it three times, finally wouldn't take it. And then before he left, Paul asked him his name. I'm Jacob, he replied. And then as quickly and unexpectedly as he had arrived, he was gone. I think an angel just changed our tire, Paul said. Only a Catholic poet, would say that. An angel with a crew cut, tattoos, and forearms like a prize fighter. An angel with the name of the guy who wrestled him into submission and now showed up on the BWI Parkway to get Paul Mariani to his reading on time, which miraculously is what happened. To this day, I credit supernatural intervention with keeping us safe that day, and also with beginning a friendship that has last for 20, lasted for 20 years. I hope you'll forgive this long lead up to my remarks about Paul's poetry this evening, but I believe it's relevant. The kind of writer Paul is has much to do with the kind of person Paul is, a fierce lover of literature, a devotee of the written word, a person possessed of a thoroughly sacramental imagination and a believer. Paul writes the way he lives with total commitment to his craft, his family, his friends and his faith. And to know the art as is to know the man. And so we gather this evening to celebrate Paul and his new book, All That Will Be New, and to hear his poems. I'd like to read one of my favorite poems from the book, and if time permits, later, maybe a second one. The poem, First Light Last, is the very first one in the book. And if you have your copy of the book, you might want to read along. Not counting the prologue, this is the first poem. And as such, it serves as an invitation into the poet's memory and imagination. 
It is in some ways a tour de force, wherein we hear the poet engaging in an argument with himself. It's a kind of psychomachia, a dramatic poem in which we see and hear conflicting elements of the poet's psyche. The poem consists of a series of interrogatives as the poet mercilessly questions himself about his aspirations, his delusions, and his failures. Interspersed amid the interrogation is another voice, a series of imperatives and exclamations in which the poet encourages himself, and I use that word encourage, gives himself the courage to do what he was meant to do, to tell his story, no matter how painful, no matter how vulnerable it makes him. The poem reminds me of W.B. Yeats's definition of poetry. Quote, we make out of the quarrel with others rhetoric, but of the quarrel with ourselves poetry. There is much to admire about this poem, but I'll hi highlight only two things and then read it. First, it is full of learning and layered illusion as all of poems, Paul, Paul's poems are, to Virgil, to Dante, to Shakespeare, to Hopkins, to Greek mythology, to the Psalms, to the prayers of the Catholic Church, all of which are seamlessly brought together in the poem. Their presence creates a depth and a richness of texture that attests to Paul's lifelong immersion in the art of the word. Second, it is a poem about the challenges and the consolations of faith. The poem begins with an epigraph from fellow Catholic writer Flannery O'Connor, who once wrote, quote, you arrive at enough certainty to be able to make your way, but it is making it in darkness. Don't expect faith to clear things up for you. It is trust, not certainty. This theme pervades this poem and the entire book. The poem dramatizes the fact that faith is a walking in darkness and that you may very well doubt the whole time you are walking, but walk you must and walk you do. And miraculously, Sometimes, somehow, you might find the light. First light last. The epigraph again from Flannery O'Connor. You arrive at enough certainty to be able to make your way, but it is making it in darkness. Don't expect faith to clear things up for you. It is trust, not certainty. And did you really think there would ever come a time when things would go as you dreamed they should? That you, you could hold the reins of some fate and fated 737 as first it whinnied, then shrugged off what you tried to make it do? You, you poor forked thing, screaming as the plane bucked before it nose dived down, down and down into the unforgiving earth below? Late January, COVID killing time and six below. Sing it, pilgrim. Sputter those words out loud. You're in the bug house now. Oh yeah, you're in the bug house now. Remember that time 30 years back in those sea fungus riddled pitch black tunnel mazes of Fort Adams? How a woman tripped and fell just behind you and you turned to help her up again, even as the guide and those in front kept moving on, your wife among them as she slid into the dark and disappeared like some Eurydice? Remember, ha, blank fear you felt as you moved slowly forward, leading the others nowhere. First turning right, then left, as you called out and the chambers echoed their muffled sounds behind you. And it hit you how you might just be leading yourself and all those others into some instant hell, some underworld where the lost or trapped and will forever dwell. Sing it then, Homer, Hezekiah, Virgil, sing. Sing the desolation of those words. Go on, sing. You're in the bug house now. Oh yeah, sick seer, sad sod. You're in the bug house now. Remember how you glimpsed that glimmer of light somewhere up ahead, then slowly groped your way down the tunnel toward it, only to come up against that small grilled window, that ignus fatus, that dead end that had seemed to hold out hope before it laughed and mocked you, you blind leader of the blind. And then in that darkness, in that mocking hellhole of a maze, as those groans and curses swelled around you, a light flickered and our guide appeared and we followed her 
this way, then that, until we reappeared once more, thank God, thank God, into the dizzle dazzling bluebell light as the others, my Eurydice among them, cheered. Sing it, sing the sacred saving words again and then again and then again. De profundus camavi ad de, ad de domini. Out of the depths, I cry to you, O Lord. Pray for us, mother, now and at the hour of our death. Sing those praises from first light on into the night and on until the blessed dawn leads us home again. Wow. Thank you, Angela. That's amazing. It's beautiful. A great way to get us started. Now I'd like to introduce Martina Espada, who will read a poem and then introduce Paul. Martina Espada has published more than 20 books as a poet, editor, essayist, and translator. His new book of poems from Norton is called Floaters, winner of the national 2021 National Book Award. Other books of poems include Vivas to Those Who Have Failed, The Trouble Ball, the Republic of Poetry, and Alabanza. He has received the Ruth Lilly Poetry Prize, the Shelley Memorial Award, the Robert Creeley Award, an Academy of American Poets Fellowship, and Penn Revson Fellowship, and a Guggenheim Fellowship. The Republic of Poetry was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. A former tenant lawyer in Greater Boston, Espada is Professor of Literature at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Martine, over to you. Thank you, Greg. And thank you, Angela. This is a poem by Paul Mariani called Instructions for Leaving Behind a Broken World. Say it. Say it while there's time, even as your world disappears like that river crashing over the Great Falls. Say it the way Hardy or Williams would have said. A teenage mother and a father, 23, hurled or unfurled together by destiny, Harriet's and Paul's. Say what needs to be said now that both of them are dead. You keep telling yourself the story's over now and done, even as it keeps seeping back morning, day, and night, random pieces of a puzzle with most of the pieces lost. Try beginning with some once upon a time begun, that New York tenement, the scalding water and the fright, the looming shadows as they trapped you and what that cost. Summon up that first world for what it was, the hot tar floor, you in your homemade army outfit as your father walked down the street to war, the bombers above the city that summer of 45. Or your mother sewing pocketbooks for food for the four of you, the orphanage you were sent to in the Bronx uptown, your head smashing the windshield as daddy braked all that jive. And on and on it goes, and no doubt will continue to do so as long as there's a single breath to breathe. It will all be there halfway through the endless nights, and there again come morning. Listen up. It's time at last you left behind that nightmare status quo. What's done is done. You have a family now to love. There's prayer. There is still a few fast friends. Leave the dead to do the mourning. Paul Mariani. So good evening, all. And welcome to this reading and celebration of Paul Mariani's new book, All That Will Be New from Slant Press. First, the facts. My dear friend Paul is a poet, essayist, biographer of poets, professor of English emeritus at Boston College, and former professor of English at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He is the author of more than 20 books including now nine collections of poetry, such as Ordinary Time, 
epitaphs for the journey, the great wheel, salvage operations, prime mover, and timing devices. He has published biographies of William Carlos Williams, Hart Crane, John Berryman, Wallace Stevens, Robert Lowell, and Gerard Manley Hopkins. His Williams biography was a finalist for the National Book Award. He has received the John Chiardi Award for Lifetime Achievement in Poetry, the Flannery O'Connor Lifetime Achievement Award, and fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Born in Queens, raised in New York City and Long Island, he lives in Montague, Massachusetts with his wife, Eileen. I met Paul in 1993 when I came on board as a professor of English at UMass Amherst. As I put it in my poem for Paul, be there when they swarm me, quote, I wandered lonely as a Puerto Rican in an English department, and you found me in the hallway, calling me brother as my own brother never would, calling me poet as if that word had never drowned at sea. Indeed, Paul was and remains a poet of the great handshake and all the stories. A very famous poet, who shall remain nameless, told me once that no poet can write a good poem after the age of 80. He offered himself as evidence of the proposition. Paul's new book is here to prove that proposition wrong. In the words of Shane McRae, quote, Paul Mariani is that rare poet who discovers late fire. A poems and all that will be new have a new energy, a new fullness, a new relentlessness even, as they confront the relentless horrors of the present. Jared Ongo had this to say, quote, in all that will be new, Mariani revivifies the old, ancestral roots, deep friendships, the splendid music of poetry, and the lavish vision of a gifted and mature seer. Paul Mariani, seer that he is, masterful narrative poet that he is, knows that the world begins and ends with stories. He knows there is no clarity in the present without clarity shed upon the past. And so he goes back to those ancestral roots with characteristic candor. It is a wonder that anyone survives such a broken world and a greater wonder still that this broken world would become the stuff of poetry. Yet, here we are. The poet, like our guide to the underworld, walks us through a world on fire. He sees Picasso's Guernica, the Basque town bombed on market day in April of 1937 by the Luftwaffe, Franco's allies killing 1,600 people as an experiment in civilian bombardment, and then the wars to come. Quote, as a broken scroll of history rolls on. He sees the assassination of Malcolm X in February of 1965. First, there's a young graduate student at Columbia taking the subway and walking to campus without realizing the gravity of the moment. Then, as a mature poet, looking back over his shoulder at history and realizing that he had been saved by the good graces of what he calls two angels in Harlem. The poet's vision illuminates the past and so illuminates the present. He walks us through the world on fire again in COVID Boogie, the terrible irony of the title slowly revealing itself, since this is a dance of death orchestrated by the unmasked bikers of Sturgis and the deranged defenders of freedom in supermarkets and discount stores, as the toll of the dead soars past one million in this country. As difficult as it may be to write well of the distant past, it is more difficult still to write in the moment. This poem does it with such command and earns my admiration especially since my only attempt to write a COVID poem resulted in something called Love Song of the Moa. Yet, even in the midst of a pandemic, there is time to mourn the passing of a great tree, such as Paul's sensitivity to the world around him, that he can write a moving 
elegy for our 131-year-old Catalpa, what the poet calls that broken body, a reminder that we, as human beings, share the fate of trees, and our empathy with the trees may yet help us somehow save the earth. This is a poet who communes with the spirits of the dead and finds consolation in those spirits. He is a poet most at home in the company of other poets, from Williams in Patterson, to Dickinson in Amherst, to Crane in the next world, but none more so than his old friend, Phil Levine, who, quote, had me laughing so hard I had to beg you, to no avail, of course, to please stop so I could catch my breath again. First, I didn't know Phil Levine had a sense of humor. Second, anyone who knows Paul knows that great laugh, which I must admit, I do my best to provoke, so he too will beg me to stop. As Williams, Dickinson, Crane, and Levine once walked among us, so Paul Mariani walks among us today. His modesty makes it easy for the rest of us to take his presence for granted. This brilliant mind, this compassionate soul, this true writer with us here and now in the year 2022. Tonight, we have the opportunity to listen as he reads his poems, but also to thank him for being here, to thank him for all of it, the poetry, the presence, the generosity, the love. Please welcome my good and great friend, Paul Mariani. Martine, thank you so much, Angela. This is so moving. I, I, I really appreciate your, your presence tonight, Greg. Thank you for bringing this together. And thank you all who are attending and listening. Uh, it's quite an honor, it really is. Um, I'm gonna start with a poem about, about how what it, what does it mean to write? How do you write? How do you how do the words get on the page? And I, I go in the book. There's a number of painters, and and the first one is Winslow Homer, and the in the prologue it's Northeaster at Prout's Neck, uh, where Winslow Homer had a cabin right on the uh, Atlantic coast, just yards from the uh, from the Atlantic Ocean. The primordial tensions of those natural forces watch as the massive waves surge forward, then back out into the vast Atlantic, as if sucked into some blue black vortex, even as another wave and then another comes crashing in to smash against the jagged granite shore. The silver glitter spume explodes just feet away, as old and now instant as that whirlwind confronting Job. How is it Homer caught the drama in his Northeaster, just yards from that rustic cabin there on Prout's neck along the coast of Maine back then? And now the painting glowers in the cloister-like environs of the New York's men, replete with a sleepy guard. Homer caught it all. School kids playing crack the whip in those fields outside some one-room schoolhouse. Those three Confederate prisoners surrendering at Petersburg to be interrogated by a Union officer. One, a hillbilly kid, another an old man lost, and that young rebel officer, hand on hip, his steady, sullen, staring in defiance even now. Then later, those Southern whites and blacks in those unforgiving years of reconstruction, that white mistress 
standing awkwardly by the door, not knowing what to say to her former slaves, nor they to her. Or those English working classes, the Bermuda natives among the sands and palmettos, the dangers of the sea, the drifting boat with a lone black man as sharks circle him with a typhoon rising in the distance. And in time, even people disappear from his canvases. And it's the sea alone the painter dwells on as that creations start. As with the poet who must face the blank canvas of the page and stare and stare and stare again. And then if he is blessed or cursed, a word at last comes uttering forth, and then another, and another, and then a line of force, a tension felt between a gray, a cobalt blue, a green, a dash of red and orange dot, and a smear of white to say, this is a painting. And then another swirl of white, as three waves spill, and then that giant wave exploding again, 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 as the thing itself, the real, comes crashing finally down on you. Another acrastic poem, this one's based on Jules Bastien Lepage, his painting Poor Favette from 1881 of a little girl in winter minding the family cow as the cow munches away on thistle and, and, and rough grass. A little girl looks right into the face of the painter, right into our faces. So forlorn, so sad. Like Uvalde like the Ukraine. Late winter, and the little girl stares off, her gaze reaching down into your soul. She's wrapped herself in a makeshift shawl of brown cloth to ward off the cold this very morning. As she stands there in some wintry field out in Danvier, minding the family cow as it feeds on straw and thistle. There are some glorious pictures, D.H. Lawrence wrote a friend after viewing the canvas at a winter exhibition some 30 years after Bastien Lepage painted the scene, the artist himself long since gone. But nothing caught his eye like this scene as he watched the lovely woman in her smart, dark velvet suit and hat, its feathers flowing down over her shoulders, a woman so unlike that poor Fauvet. Too sad, the woman whispered, as she confided to the man beside her there. But then, that is what the country does to one. And now the moment over, the two moved on to yet another landscape and then another. And here's the thing. It's the gaze of that little girl, isn't it? That embeds itself upon your heart before you too find yourself likewise turning away. How many times have you been stopped when you least expected? by someone asking you to look at them and listen. Like the daughter of an old friend, himself long gone, catching you in the frozen parking lot of the old brick church just after mass this morning, when all you wanted was to climb inside your car for warmth, her face and yours marked by this pandemic. Though her teary eyes spoke volumes as she began to speak of the deep rifts between her brother and herself. And what was there for you to do 
but listen in that freezing morning. Pain is pain. Pain is personal. Still, you've learned to listen, which somehow seems to help. To help the other as it helps your sorry self just to know you care. Something that seems to repeat itself more and more now, giving back something of yourself. Like that bread just offered you, which you consumed before you left the parking lot to head back home for coffee, eggs, and toast, which is more than what poor Fauvet will feast on when she returns this evening back home, cold and weary to sup on her daily bread, if that, both those gazes etched now on your heart. The next poem is an Italian poem. Uh, it's uh, Those Beloved Ghosts of Compiano. That's where uh, my grandparents, my father's parents uh, came from up in, up in the north of Italy uh, all those years ago. Immigrants to this country back in 1896 and 97. Wallace Stevens late in life, evoking the ghost of Coleridge, another poet philosopher, then in his twenties, starting out on a packet bound for Germany, invited by some Danes to share a drink. He was dressed in black with large shoes and worsted stockings so that they mistook him for some Methodist on a mission. Though the fact was he was on his way to Göttingen to learn what language has to teach us. Doctor theology, they joked, half drunk and having one hell of a time up on the deck. No, he said, no, he wasn't that. Then what? Um, philosoph, perhaps? No, he said, that was the last thing he thought himself as being, though that in fact was what he was. Well, they laughed. Weren't we all philosophers? And with that, he joined them for a song until all rose as one and danced on the deck, a set of dances. Oh, happy day when the philosopher and the poet could sing and dance together, a cup of wine held high in your hand as angel headed hipster Danes danced on and the river flowed on and on beneath your feet and evening descended gently with each passing moment. Each night now, as this play keeps descending on us, refusing to let go, my dreams turn strange and stranger as if I were some blind Orion searching for the rising sun. Like you, I'm on a journey. The where I'm going changes with each moment. Sometimes I'm in a car driving with my wife beside me, who's there until she isn't. Or I'm on a plane, every last seat empty now, my destination unknown even to the pilot. Or I'm on a boat watching peasants dance their madcap turns like the ones you see in Bruegel's Kermesse as some unheard music goes reeling on. Mostly though, I'm just walking, one step followed by another. Sometimes there's a stranger walking there beside me but who never says a word. And then like that, there's no one there but me. And I'm thinking to myself that if I just keep moving on, I'll get to where I'm going. 
The trouble is, I don't seem to know where it is I'm going, or even if there's any place to get to. When I was four, I remember walking with my father, taking one giant step and then another to keep up. We went bounding up First Avenue, 10 blocks to 61st, one row of tenements after the other, till we came to where he'd lived, though the building itself had disappeared to make room for an exit off the bridge. Old men he'd known with toothless grins sat on stools, greeting us with that valditaro patois of theirs. It was the spring of 44, and the army had finally called him up. And though some who'd grown up with him would not survive the war, he made it through, walking draftees through the intricacies of carburetors and air fuel induction. And now here we were, my father come this one last time for a glass of wine and to say is ave atque vale, hello campesane, and now goodbye. 50 years before, his parents sailed here to America, where the streets they'd heard were paved with gold, though the only paving my nono ever knew was the tar he laid, until the asbestos pulled him under. Compiano was the town they'd hailed from. Giuseppe first, then Julia, who brought their firstborn with her. Primo, run over at the entrance to this very bridge the day after Christmas, 1907. He just turned 12. In time, others in the family sank from history too. Infants mostly, what with cholera, pneumonia, and the rest. Mary, with that large bow in her hair, made it to 15, almost surviving the Spanish flu before they lost her. My father, who was three then, told me how he'd sat there on her coffin, lost in the back of a horse-drawn wagon, as they readied Mary for her final trip across the 59th Street Bridge to Queens and Calvary. I have walked the streets of Compiano twice now, once with my own son Paul, and once with Alan, poet, philosopher, who spoke in his polished Italian with a local priest to learn what little could be gleaned of those beloved ghosts I know now only through a few inscriptions in the local registry. Much of the story, like so many others, burned by German soldiers as they left the town behind them in the spring of 45 and headed back across the mountains. Still, what would I say to them, these beloved ghosts of Compiano? if I should meet them. Will those others who lie silent somewhere in my blood? What words, poet, philosophe, would suffice? And still the river runs beneath my feet as they sing on and on in dreams. Is it that in the end, there are no words, that there are only ghosts now who keep calling out to us? beckoning us to rise and dance along beside them while there's still time. This poem is called That Morning After the Assassination of Malcolm X. It opens with a headnote from Jeremiah. 
terror on every side. Denounce him. Let us denounce him. All my friends are waiting for me to slip. They say, perhaps he will be deceived. Then we will prevail over him and take our revenge on him. Get back on the train, he said, then go back downtown to 59th and take the number one. He was in his mid fifties, I think, the man behind the booth, brown, soft-spoken, eyes down. Then take the train back uptown to 116th and get off at Columbia University. He told me this, I have come to see, to keep me from getting off the train there in Harlem on that dead and silent morning. No, I told myself, after all, I was already up at 116th. Easier to just walk up the subway steps, cut through the park at morning sight, and on to the campus. This was February 22nd, 1965. A bright, crisp mo Monday morning. I'd come up on the subway from Hunter to get a copy of How to Read French, which the adjunct at Hunter had assigned us. One more way of talking I'd have to learn to pass my PhD exam come fall. One more piece of the jagged jigsaw puzzle I'd have to fit together if I was ever going to earn my degree in English and comp lit from the Dons at the City University of New York. Understand, I was a week shy of my 25th, married now 18 months and living in a two family apartment on Booth Memorial out in far flung Flushing, our firstborn already well on his way. The fact that a black man named Malcolm X had just been killed with a blast from a hidden sort of shotgun the afternoon before at the Audubon Ballroom north of here in Harlem had registered, I think, but barely. But what had any of this to do with me? This was New York City, you have to understand. And this was the 60s. And what did I know anyway about this Malcolm with that X in the place of some white slave master's name? And wasn't this the guy who, when JFK was shot down in Dallas 15 months before, had said how the chickens had finally come home to roost? The same man who'd called Cassius Clay, now thanks to him, Muhammad Ali, his close friend, until they too had parted ways to Ali's too late regret. The man who once took on William Buckley in that debate about white privilege and won. Only after I got my prize degree and moved on to teach up in Amherst did I begin to put the pieces of the puzzle back together when I came at last to teach Malcolm's autobiography and learned what courage the man had to have to face down the rank corruption in the leader he'd followed for a dozen years, the prophet Elijah Muhammad, and turned instead to Mecca for the strength he saw, the faithful orphan so he could carry on, in spite of being targeted by the FBI and New York's finest, the blind side of human nature being what it is. Add to all of this his beloved Betty there on that stage with him, mother of their four daughters, with two more on the way, whom he would never live to see. Add to the shotgun, wounds to his chest, left shoulder, arms and legs, the blood gurgling from his mouth as he lay dying. And hadn't the leader of the nation miffed at Malcolm's leaving made it known how the man was now a traitor and so must die. And if he himself washed his hands of the job, not so his followers. 
And now Malcolm X Shabazz was dead. Though not his message. No, not what he had had to learn the hard way about the cost of learning to love your brother, black, brown, or even white. That ice cold morning, as I walked the ghost-like streets of Harlem toward the looming heights, two young black men in dark suits stood there on the sidewalk talking, surprised to see a white man like myself with a briefcase in his hand walking there, even as it dawned on me that I might well be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And here's the thing, like two angels, they stared, winked, parted, and let me pass. Emily Dickinson, great poet that I love so much. Uh, even when Eileen and I got married back in 63, we went on a honeymoon, we came up to Amherst where I could visit the house. Uh, she's always just been such an inspiration for me. So I tried a poem in her uh, hymnal form, in her, her four threes, four threes, uh, the ballad uh, form. Emily waves from her bedroom window as we pass by. The drum beat of your church hymn form, your four threes, four threes riffling on, those ghosts beneath your evergreens gathering as the sun goes down. I felt a funeral in my brain, you sighed, full knowing well what were the deaths of A and B that soon the bell would have to knell for you as well across the land of goldenrod and rose as now those gentian flocks perk up and tilt their parasols and shadows gather once again across that open field, all headed for the burial ground where secrets must stay sealed. Yes, once again, we mourn your loss as now we follow after, hoping to learn as time treads on the courage of your laughter. Two more. This one is called The Other Side. The Other Side. We lost uh, dear friends, we, uh, we'd known Margaret for over half a century, Eileen and Margaret baked together. They traveled everywhere together with the kids all those years. And here we were in their house just the, the last day before she died. All those years you lunched with Margaret or spent time cooking meals together, baking cookies batch after batch Meals at Thanksgiving, and yes, especially come Christmas time. Our boys out on the lawn beneath the maples playing catch. Oh, those years vacationing on the Cape or strolling the avenues at Naples and ancient Pompeii with its new uncovered news. And now here we were beside her as the end drew near this lovely woman we'd known for over 50 years. Her body racked with illness after illness and so much pain. There was her younger son who'd flown in from Eugene with his wife and kids to comfort her now. His guitar strumming an old ballad about going home at last. Her other boy was missing, no longer there for her. And there was nothing we could do to change that now. And there was Jim, lost in that dark moment, trying to find something in images of Roman cemeteries, his mind grasping for whatever Seneca 
where Cicero might tell him now, still, what did the future hold for him? The past was past. That much we understood as on each fleeting moment fled. But then there you were, my dear, kneeling down beside her as she sat hunched, staring helplessly on her bed as suddenly you gazed into her near vacant eyes and said, we'll lunch again together, Margaret, on the other side. The words surprising us until Stoic Jim let go at last and cried. And so it goes. The unanswered questions you dare not ask. And then the moment that undoes death's dreaded mask. Yes, dear Margaret, we'll lunch together on the other side. And then finally, a uh, poem called The Wheel, The Wheel. These are for my guardian angels, okay, this poem. The Wheel, The Wheel. 16 and a half with a brand new driver's license in my wallet, driving my father's 47 two-toned old clunky Pontiac. I turned left off Hempstead Turnpike when a car, what make or color I can't recall, appears shark-like off to my right and it's there in front of me and I'm twisting the steering wheel first left and right when somehow, and this I swear to friend, the wheel itself takes over, spinning this way, then that, the danger's past and the car disappears into the past and I breathe again. This was 65 years ago, mind you, and still, I can't explain what happened. Do you believe in guardian angels? Well, since that day, I confess I do. I don't know if they have wings or not, but they sure have strength, like the one who wrestled Jacob that, that dark night. And they're there all right. The wheel, the wheel, that force behind those starry wheels that spin about the earth. Heaven wheels above you, revealing her great glories, Dante sang. And still, your eyes stay focused on the ground. But trapped behind that wheel, something deigned to save the car and me. And I alone am left to tell the story. Thank you. Oh, that was wonderful. Beautiful, moving, provocative as always. Thank you so much. Thank you. you know, we've been so uh, efficient on time. Angela, you said you had one other that you wanted to read. Do you think we could sneak that one in? I, think I, would, love, yes. I would love to do that if, uh, if, if Paul doesn't mind. <laughs> Um, another poem I love in this book, and it's in some ways a departure from some of the ones that Paul has been reading, so I'm happy to read it because it shows the great range of, uh, of formal experimentation Paul is doing and also the great range of spirit that we see in the volume. Uh, but there's a charming, utterly charming book poem called Poet as 80-Year-Old Sue Chef, and it's a delightfully playful poem about play. The use of the form is very clever. Um, it's, uh, he's using meter and rhyme, gives us the pleasures of reader, reader, meter and rhyme. I'm not sure what the form is. I'm gonna ask Paul after I read the poem. It might be a new take on the Spencerian stanza. It might be a variation on Ottava Rima. It's probably a mashup of both, um, putting together Paul's twin pensions for things Italian and things English. Uh, but the other thing about the poem that's striking to me is re it reminds me of another great poet who wrote beautifully well into his 80s and 90s, Shazla Milos. And one of Milos's poems is called A Poetic State, in which the mature poet confesses that after a lifetime of writing heavily themed, prophetic, politically engaged poetry, he now focuses on the small sensory pleasures of life, 
on every minute of the spectacle of the world, which astonishes him. So rather than worry about the state of the macrocosm, the true poet's poetic state is to live in tune with the microcosm. So he describes this newfound poetic state in the conclusion of his poem, now attentively, I cut onions, squeeze lemons, and prepare various kinds of sauces. These lines uncannily are akin to Paul's pay on to the pleasures of the sous chef, as you'll hear in a minute. Um, I love the idea of poets Mariani and Milos trading recipes in the kitchen with Paul's wife, Eileen, looking on and giving direction. So here is the poet as 80 year old sous chef. Sorry, I have so many poems marked, I must find it. <laughs> page 17, there we are. What better way to spend my time now than to play the sous chef as my wife, I'm sorry, let me, tell, let me begin this again. It deserves a better opening. What better way to spend my time now than to play the sous chef as my dear wife prepares this very day yet another of her heavenly meals, cinnamon yellow squash soup with hints of fresh mint, a melting mellow eggplant parmesan, chicken a la Francaise, apple crumble pie. Ah, lucky me to have been chosen to dice the scallions and onions, peel the potatoes, gather from our little garden parsley, basil, and some thyme, then back inside to uncork a bottle of three-star wine. Oh, to put aside the books that keep staring up at me, clamoring to be read, a fresh translation of the Odyssey, Dante's Convivio, Flannery, Chesterton, and Joyce, as well as a dozen poets, each with his or her distinctive voice, but who too often now remain unsung. And that pile of books, each clamoring to be blurbed and praised, as by the looks of them they no doubt deserve. But oh, that freedom just to be. But be what? Now it's half past five and she's calling up to me. Time, dear, she sings, to be the sous chef you were called to be. Thank you so much, Paul, for that poem <laughs> and for all of these poems. <laughs> oh, delightful. Thanks for sharing that with us, Angela. So we do have one question and uh, it's this, Paul, if you, if you have a moment to, to respond to it. He says, Paul, I loved all the illusions that I caught or imagined. How do you think of allusion in your poetry? Well, you know, there, there is so many voices out there, Greg. You know, there is so many uh, inspirations, uh, so many, so many books that I've read over the years, uh, so they're, they're ghosts and, and they're there. And um, it's like it's like carrying on uh, a colloquy, uh, echoing them. Uh, and then, you know, it, and then the reader picks up and says, oh, yeah, that's a little bit of Flannery O'Connor, or that's a little bit of Dante, or that's a little bit of Virgil, or that's a little bit of Martina Sparrow, you know, Angela, et cetera. And they were all in there. Uh, uh, so uh, this is, uh, you know, two things. I, I come from a working class background. So I want to get, and Williams has been very important to me in terms of the American idiom. Um, on the other hand, there's also that sense that uh, what Hopkins also taught me in, in many ways, the early Ezra Pound and so many others, uh, all of these uh, various, and then of course Dante. Uh, so they all have a place uh, to be in there. Um, they just echo. Uh, I don't. I don't. I don't know. Listen, I didn't invent the paints. I didn't invent yellow and red and blue, etc. I, I, I borrow them, right? When you when, when the painter. Uh, all of these, the words aren't, you know, they're mine in a sense, but they're, they're so, you know, like their their dollar bills have been passed around, and they, there's a currency in them, and uh, uh, currency in or courant, etc. Uh, and 
that's that's the nature of the language for me. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Paul. Yes, I I mean illusion in your work is all these voices, as you say, um, a kind of beautiful conversation across the generations, across the centuries, yeah. across cultures and poetic voices. And that long poem that you've written, the what is it called, a paraplum? Oh yes, the paraplum. Yes, with uh, here I am, uh, the uh, the poet, you know, going to the underworld. And this time, my Virgil is uh, is done. Is uh, the translator Alan Mandelbaum, who used to call me Bubula, you know, is a, <laughs> and uh, uh, so it's Alan uh, who takes uh, takes me through the underworld, and I visit each of the poets, uh, you know, that I wrote that I spent forty years writing biographies of, you know, uh, William Carlos Williams and John Berryman and Lowell and Hart Crane and Wallace Stevens and Hopkins, um, yeah. So yeah. Uh, and and let them speak. You know, what do they have to say to me now? Yeah. That poem reminded me of that passage from the uh, Four Quartets where Eliot meets like the spirit of Yeats. And so your poem seemed to be yet another kind of, you know, echo of that, that kind of encounter, um, which I thought was really beautiful. You know, Greg, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned uh, Eliot. I mean, I would have done a biography of Eliot if, if 50, 50 people hadn't beaten me to it. <laughs> and you, I mean, I've got all of his, uh, uh, all of his uh, letters uh, up to the mid 30s so far that have been published. Uh, I, Eliot's been a very, very profound in, in, uh, influence on me. And the four quartets, and as you say, uh, 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 the voice of Yeats that he meets in the underworld. I mean, all of that is, is, is part of it. Yeah, no doubt yeah. about it. Well, we've managed to get a couple more questions. I think that's all we'll have time for. So the first one has to do with I think in response to one of your ekphrastic poems, um, how often do you draw upon the visual arts for inspiration? A lot, a very, uh, 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 all, all the time. Uh, I mean, if, 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 if you would, I think there are like nine poems in this volume alone during the, especially during the COVID period. You know, uh, I think of William Carlos Williams, for example, uh, towards the end, after he had suffered the strokes and all, writing pictures from Bruegel. And he's got, you know, they're in his table uh, in uh, Nine Ridge Road there uh, in Rutherford. Uh, on the table is, is, a, is a, a, a coffee book table of uh, pictures from Bruegel. And he uses that to, as the basis, what, what he sees in Bruegel, for example, in terms of, say, uh, a schoolyard, okay? And then Williams as a doctor working with kids in those same, in those kinds of schoolyards. So Bruegel and Williams. Uh, yeah, so th that, uh, the, the painting, uh, I, I love painters. I, I go to every museum I possibly can as often as possible. I'm constantly looking at the paintings uh, as inspirations for me. Uh, others, uh, I, su I suppose there's music. But for me, I think it's it's the eye, you know. It's it's what what the uh, painters can teach me, so I keep coming back to them again and again and again. Yeah. And then finally, there's a question that it notes that you've had this beautiful flowering of poetry since you published your last biography. So the question is, do you find it more difficult to write your own poetry when you're steeped in the work of the biography, or? Are they not causally connected in, in that way? You know, uh, Greg, I, I, this has been a, a, if I may say this, a, a kind of blessing for me, these last two volumes, uh, Ordinary Time, uh, and then uh, All That Will Be New, which you've published both of them. And thank you. And these, I, I really see these as a kind of culmination of the work that uh, I've been doing. And they've, they've come after, uh, Eileen said, you're no longer going to write any more biographies. You've done that. You're going to be a sous chef now. <laughs> I said, okay, dear, you know, which is great. And, uh, uh, but uh, the, th there's just been, uh, just, it, it, it's been a, a kind of grace for me 
to be able to uh, to uh, to write these poems and to kind of sum things up uh, in my 70s and early 80s now, you know, wh where it's all led to, Greg, yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you, Paul. Thank you um, to Angela, to Martine, to yes. Sam Sorek, the creative director of Glass Darkly Films, who's been our showrunner. Uh, this evening, I hope you will allow me just a couple final uh, footnotes to wrap things up. Um, all that will be new is available for purchase through all the major online retailers. If you go to slantbooks.org, the link is at the top of the chat. You can find links for several of those outlets. So pick the one that you're most comfortable ethically and personally ordering from. And now just two final notes. We hope you'll keep an eye out for announcements of our next online book launch event which will be take place in about a month when we will feature the dazzling debut novel by Jonathan Geltner, Absolute Music. And let me just give you the short uh, blurb for that. On an eerily warm October evening in a suburb of Detroit, a new father and struggling fantasy novelist named McPhail gazes at a honey locust tree. The sight triggers a memory of the sudden inexplicable death of Hannah, whom he loved when they were both 14. So begins a year long odyssey in which McPhail becomes obsessed with recollections of Hannah, puts his job and his marriage in jeopardy and fears that his obsolete consciousness is spiraling into apocalyptic religious and ecological despair. Unable to complete the fantasy he has contracted to write, McPhail instead composes this book behind the book in his effort to re-enchant the world for himself and his growing family and to lay to rest old griefs along with more recent regrets. Metaphysical, lyrical, elegiac, absolute music is a novel of consciousness that is at the same time grounded in memorable characters and shaped by a variety of landscapes from Cincinnati and Pittsburgh to County Clare and Japan. In the character of McPhail, you might detect a distant cousin of Walker Percy's Binks Bowling or Richard Ford's Frank Baskin, but he remains very much a man of our own time. So we'll be sending out plenty of uh, notices when we'll be holding that online book la launch event um, for you to, to be able to uh, make your reservation, register and, and attend that. And then finally, I will click on one last link for you. I will just remind you that Slant Books is in fact a nonprofit press. So your tax deductible donations make possible the kind of meticulous editing and high production values that maintain the highest literary standards and ensure that quality books that might not otherwise be available or accessible are given the treatment they richly deserve. To support our work, just go to slantbooks.org and click on donate. Thank you very much and see you next time. <music>